All right. Well, welcome. Uh, so glad that you're here, and thank you um, uh, to, first of all, this is what is becoming an annual Speak Out event, where students get an opportunity to uh, to have an audience, thanks to everybody who shows up, so thank you for showing up today and being here, to speak about uh, issues that are of pressing concern in our community that they've been working on all semester long, uh, that are of concern to them, but also to all of you. By the way, my name is Mike McGuire, and my students are from Composition 2, which is a research writing course. I remind my students that not only do they have an audience in all of you here today, but they have a much larger audience that is not quite visible here because this is being recorded today and will be made available through the library's website as well as their YouTube channel. It'll be searchable by future students who may be doing research on similar issues in our communities uh, so that they will influence, inform, and inspire others down the road. So that's pretty exciting. Far more exciting to me, I know, than it may be to my students. But I hope they'll get excited about it before long. So You're all, you are welcome. <laughs> OK. Um, so this is a research writing class that has brought us together here today. And as I mentioned, my students have been researching social issues in our communities uh, throughout this semester. Uh, and the kind of research they've been doing has certainly uh, brought them to the library, as all good research should, but it has also brought them beyond the library and beyond the class out into our communities, into the field, so to speak, field work research. And this field research came in the form of what I'm calling critical uh, service learning. Critical service learning is a combination of meaningful service with our community, uh, uh, civic skills and uh, enhanced academics. The intersection of those three things is critical service learning. So um, my students this semester, all of our speakers today, have worked with over 23 uh, community nonprofits in our communities. Uh, organizations that are focused on issues such as uh, food insecurity and homelessness, animal rights, early childhood education, ecological restoration, and everything in between. Quite a range of issues, honestly, they've been working on all semester long. All of this research and writing is really aimed at affecting positive social change in our communities. And today, you all are a part of that change as well. Everybody in this room is a part of that change. So please, please listen carefully to these speakers today um, with an open heart and an open mind as they tell you the story of themselves, the story of ourselves, and most importantly, the story of right now. Okay. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Henry. Our lineup is on the board, if you didn't know. So, and Bilal is in the room, so we've got a full lineup for you today. Come on down, Henry. Let's clap for Henry. Hello. Um, well, this is great that I'm starting, but my name's Henry, once again. And um, a show of hands, has it been a rough year for everybody so far, 2017? Yeah, you know, ups, downs, everything. So over you know, this year, it's been a rough year for everybody. And one person I can really rely on is my cat, Tom. It sounds strange that I think of him as a person, but Tom, to me, is everything. You know, took him in as a stray, been with me for 10 years, and every day he, you know, gets up, eats food with my dad in the morning at like four, and then comes to my bed, sleeps with me, and then wakes up once again at, you know, nine o'clock when my alarm goes off. Once he does this, you know, he gets me to get up, go out, you know, eat food, like also give him a second breakfast, his little greedy self. But for him, um, he every day is able to motivate me to get up and do things in my life, you know, not be stagnant, not be just, you know, laying in my bed, letting life go to waste. So, you know, I, I can count on Tom, you know, when I'm down, when I have bad days, he also is able to like see that in me, he's able to come to me, you know, cuddle with me, make me feel better. And to me, animals are very special. Like, I've been, you know, raised with cats. I love cats. They've been a part of my life, and they're social creatures. Some people, some people that don't own animals, they don't necessarily understand that animals also have feelings as us. They, you know, when we're sad, they'll be sad, you know, and everything. Um, one of the research topics I did while working with the Animal Welfare League was Anka um, Gies, and in her article that I read, she talks about how animals are social creatures, they have emotions, and they need more than just food, water, and shelter. 
They need attention, affection, and like loving care. For this, that's what makes an animal thrive. That's what makes their life purpose like happy and continuing on. While I was working with the Animal Welfare League, I was able to interact with animals and I was able to talk with people. These animals not necessarily are super afraid and scared of people, but they're timid. You know, they're you know, usually in a cage for most of the time during the day. They you know, don't have as much attention as you know, everybody would like to give each individual animal. But as I was working at the Animal Welfare League, I was able to talk to this one man named John and over, he wasn't very, you know, great at showing his emotions towards animals, but from how he talked and how he interacted with animals, I definitely knew he cared. He was able to, um, I don't want to say necessarily rescue, but as like foster and also adopt 67 animals, I believe it was, over his nine years of work at the Animal Welfare League, which is an astonishing feat. I've only cared for four animals in my entire life, and this man is able to been or been able to care for 67. He's been able to give them food, water, shelter, home, like just a loving environment where they can thrive and live out their days. So this, like with my topic, I want to show that the Animal Welfare League is a great place, but everybody should, you know, do their own individual part outside. And that doesn't mean, you know, you necessarily need to go and above and beyond and do things. It's just the little things that it adds up. Every day if you do something which involves, you know, caring for an animal or doing something, you know, being just being involved in helping that animal. With this, um, in my neighborhood, I have uh, neighbors, the Godinuses, and they're very good people. I've been neighbors with them my whole entire life, you know, good family, good people. They're, they'll make tamales and they'll sell them to us and it's just great. The one thing though with them is they've owned probably, I think four or five dogs over the past maybe like 10 to 15 years. And the, they don't understand one thing about America. In other countries, they you know, can let their animals roam. They'll go in packs and they'll feed together, you know, all that. And, then, and with the packs, they'll get the love and attention they need, the animals. But in America, we usually have our you know, animals indoors at most of the times. It's a very personal experience for us. We don't just let our animals roam around the neighborhood. And with my neighbors, the Godinuses, they leave their animals out. And you know, it's not necessarily that they're maliciously mistreating the animals, but they just don't know the cultural like, difference from you know, Mexico to here. So you know, they've had animals and they've been necessarily just you know, not cared for in the American way. But I have talked to them and I've tried to like, show them that in America it's very different. Here we you know, care for our animals, we give, like, leave them inside because there's no animal packs out there that you know, will give the attention that each animal needs. And on the other scale, my brother's girlfriend will just call it animal control and she'll just get the law involved, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's not a good set point to teach them. Because if you don't teach people, how can they you know, grow? How can they expand? With the teaching, it's something that might seem small, might seem insignificant, but just interacting with someone and, and showing them the way that you would you know, think it would be in the best interest for the animal is a great way instead of just calling someone and just getting the animal taken away. Um, so with this going on, it's a very um, touchy subject for me because it's, it's something that I strive for every day, like just seeing an animal, just you know, uh, wanting them to be cared for and loved for. You want them to, you know, thrive when you thrive. You don't want your animals to be in pain or anything like this. Just being involved every day, whether if you go and volunteer at the Animal Welfare which is a great place to do it, or just, you know, finding people and, you know, if you see someone mistreating or just, you know, not caring for the animal fully, it's a good place to start just to just talk about it, just to bring up something to talk with them. And so, I would just like people just to be aware to talk about animals because they aren't necessarily just animals that eat, you know, need shelter and sleep. 
They are social creatures. I can tell when my animal is sad. I can tell his emotions, and I can tell when uh, my animal like wants affection and attention. So the th one thing I'd like you, for you guys to take away from this is that animals are social creatures. They need love and attention, and you're the person that can give it to them. Thank you. Hi, my name is Philomena. And um, when I was younger, I never thought of bullying as serious or a big deal. I never experienced bullying until a few years ago when I participated in summer camp. My bullying experience was not what many people think bullying is. I did not experience bullying like Carrie did when pig's blood got spilt on the front of her dress and everybody stood around horribly laughing. No, my experience was, in fact, the opposite. I experienced bullying as the person who was left out because I was different. I didn't go to the same school as all the other kids had. I didn't know anybody there, and it was my first time being at summer camp. I remember every time I tried to join a conversation, the room would fall silent. And every time I tried to, like I would walk in and out of the room, I heard whispers and giggles. And most of all, I remember being excluded. While my experience was not as Carrie's was, it felt like a pin was poking me over and over until I felt broken inside. Like it would have been better if I had never been there. Once I came to the realization of how it feels to be left out because I was different, I started to pay more attention to what bullying truly is and its true effects. That it isn't this harmless illusion I thought it was, but serious and even deadly. Many of you here may not think that it's serious like I did, but apparently, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, suicide was found to be the third leading cause among all youth deaths. Suicide was found to be a natural response to bullying, and for every suicide among the youth, there were at least 100 attempts. I know many of us here have experienced bullying at one point in our life. Whether we were made fun of because of our looks, or because of what job we might have, because of what income or political stance we have, because of our race, or our physical appearance, or our sex or sexual orientation, and everything else that divides the U.S. We all know these unpleasant feelings, these feelings of not being accepted, not being wanted, not being good enough. We find ourselves falling into depression, into self-hate, into anxiety, and in worst cases, into death. I'm not exaggerating when I say that bullying can and does affect everyone involved. And whether we'd like to admit it without the knowledge of what bullying truly is and its true effects, we can be and are bullying others without even being aware. Many of us only see ourselves as the victim, and many of us only see ourselves as the bully. But all of us are a part of the problem, all victims and all bullies. If we don't accept that we all play a role in bullying, then we are not accepting each other and the real problem. We are all unaccepting at times because we know what it feels like to be unaccepted. It's time for us to take action now. It's time for us to change not only the way we view bullying, but the way we treat each other as human beings. Taking action can be as simple as educating yourself and others about what bullying truly is and its true effects. That bullying is the act of harming others to their detriment, whether it is physical, emotional, or psychological. We need, here as teachers and students and adults, we need, to take, we need to set examples of kindness, togetherness, compassion, and overall diversity, because otherwise bullying will continue to divide us and the U.S. Will you make the choice to accept others as they truly are, or will you continue to bully? Thank you. What's up? I'm Nico. Or Nicholas. I've grown up with tons of pets. I've always been a caretaker. I always loved caring for animals. I always uh, had a feeling for them. As I got more and more pets, I was uh, really skilled at taking care of them. And I got more and more attached with them. It got to the point where if I couldn't take care of an animal for myself, I would feel kind of bad inside. It really started to affect me. If I ever went to the pet store because my sister's goldfish died, I kind of felt bad for the goldfish. You might think that may be a little bit pity, but I felt bad for her, too. It was, a, it was a mutual sadness. It's like it was death for an animal, but it's also kind of like a death for a person. It, it matters about your connection to the, per, to the person, to the animal. That kind of connection is very, very powerful. 
And when I, when I went to the Animal Welfare League, seeing a whole bunch of animals, I, I already knew what I was signing up for. I was already prepared for the pain. I already saw these animals. They're all locked up in the cages. Sad eyes. You locked eyes with the animal. They jumped up and they stared at you, thinking that you were the one. And I was just like, oh, oh. I felt so bad. But I, I was ready. My friend wasn't. My friend Jack, I brought him with him. Br- brought him with me. He lasted minutes. I'm talking minutes, and you could just see it in his face. He was slowly turning red. First, it was ghost white when he walked in. He, he's, he's pale, so I always... But as he was slowly turning red, it was, it was surprising to me. And then he was, he was getting more and more attached as the animals started barking at him. They all jumped up at him. They all, he started making eye contact, and I was just like, dude, we got to get out of this room. Got to get out of this room. Because inside the other room, you got to at least see the animals getting taken out. You got to see the animals have some joy, some freedom. And that's why I really helped them out. I went to the Animal Welfare League, and it made me feel better. It made me feel better. I went there, I walked a dog, and it felt nice. It was just nice to let the dog out of the cage, to have some human affection for it, some care for it. And they called it the runs, and that's what it was. It was literally just like uh, cages, big tall cages. You'd walk in there, you could let the dog in. They were called the runs because you let the dog run up back and forth, back and forth for about 17 times until they, like, lay down. They're panting. They're out of breath. It's funny, but it was, it was more like for me. It, it, it may have been a release of energy for them, but it was more like a happiness for me. It felt good to do it. And this, this issue of having, having animals locked up brought me to the attention of more animals of how they're being mistreated. Some animals I looked upon a web page, and I was, I, was, I was very sad because I normally, I'm norm, normally more into the ocean. And I heard how uh, Norway, yeah, there's a ship out in Norway that's sailing around, and they're killing dolphins by the, by the masses. And I, I read this article, and I just looked at the front page, and I saw all of them gathered up, and I was already like, I already know what the rest of this article is about. I barely need to read it. I already know what's going to happen. A whole bunch of people standing around with a net. Dolphins trapped behind a massive net. And one dolphin escapes and it sits there. And it turns around and watches its family get killed. That, that hurt me. I was like, oh. Yeah. It's like uh, some animals have feelings. You may think that, no, they don't. No, ha, ha, it's just an animal and you just kick it. Oh, I hate you. But as you come to get the experience with animals, you feel a better connection. You feel better for yourself. You feel better that you're actually doing something that helps protect, helps protect the environment, helps the community. You may not know it, but it does. And it doesn't just help the community. It also helps you. Helps you, helps the animal, helps the community, helps nature. It's just good. Animal Welfare League was, uh, I felt like it was a small step for me. It was, a little, it was a small fight for a good cause. Fighting for the animals' rights. Making them cared for. Making them free. Treating them right the way that they need to be. And there's, there's so many more ways that you can go out there. You can, you can uh, what was it? It was like you can vote for your senator to petition to send, what was it, the U.S. Embassy to go to Norway to stop the Norwegians from killing the dolphins by the dozens. Masses, I should say. Not, I shouldn't say dozens. That's an understatement. There's so many more things you could also do. There's uh, butchering in Africa, the killing rhinos. They stop. They're slowing that down, but there's people who still go out there and they still do it. I still, th- I still say it's wrong. I don't feel that it's right. That's why I want to make a call out for you. If you don't really feel the need, it's okay, I understand. It's pretty scary. I saw it in the eyes of my friend. It is a scary fight, but it needs to be something that needs to be taken care of. That's why I ask you, what will you do?
Will you join the fight for animal rights? Okay, so hi everyone, thank you for being here. My name is Rowan Al Shafi. By a show of hands, who in here has ever been asked the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, pretty much all of us, right? So one of the most common questions asked as we're kids is, other than what do you want for ice cream or what do you want for dinner, is what do you want to be when you grow up? And usually we receive answers like, I want to be a princess or a dinosaur hunter, an astronaut, you know, whatever kids say these days. So when I was about five years old, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was about five years old, my parents asked me, Rowan, what do you want to be when you grow up? Without hesitation, I said, Mom, Dad, I want to be a teacher. Teacher, why? Well, because Miss Candy. Miss Candy was two things. She was my preschool teacher and my first inspiration that, <clears throat> my first inspiration why I wanted to be a teacher when I'm older. <clears throat> so all my teachers and professors in my life, they get, all inspired me in different ways. Whether it was that strict teacher who inspired me to be disciplined, or whether it was that one teacher who brought the guitar to class and started singing to us. She taught me to be creative. And for that really funny teacher who teaches between cheesy jokes, they taught me to be, um, you know, they taught me to take everything seriously, but with a little um, humor involved. So when I say teacher, I don't mean a person standing in front of a classroom saying, okay, Y equals MX plus B, guys, you know. I mean a person who you can look at or you can ask questions and they answer them. A wise man, Bill Nye, the science guy, I'm sure some of you guys know him, he said, um, everyone you will ever meet knows something you don't. Therefore, everyone in their own, own peculiar way, we're all teachers. <clears throat> so, with that being said, teachers, they can be teaching art or science or math. Who in here wants to be a mathematician? Two people out of, I don't know how many people are in here. Who wants to be a scientist? One person. Who wants to do something with art or music? These are all equally important things. So why should we fund one thing more than the other? Why should I tell my niece who told me I want to be a paintbrush when I'm older so I can paint pretty pictures? Why, can't I tell, why should I tell her, listen, sweetie, you can't be a painter or an artist or a paintbrush, as she said. Because um, governments, or the government, sorry, <laughs> they're not funding these things as much as they should be funding them. They're funding more of the scientists or the mathematicians or the sports, which are all equally as important. But nothing is more important than the next in this situation. <clears throat> One of the most important things that should be funded right now, in my own opinion and some of yours, is the challenges we face as students, as teachers, as parents, and as <clears throat> children every single day, whether it's anxiety, it's depression, it's ADD, ADHD, whatever, or whether you have a physical challenge, whether you can't walk or you can't see right. And should we include these people with us as one united nation or should we expel them and have them be alone and excluded from us and feel as if they're looked down upon? I don't think so. We should do something about these situations happening. We shouldn't just sit there and watch it happen. Technology. Technology is one of the most surprising situations happening in the educational programming. Whether it's the computers, it's the iPhones, it's the laptops. About two weeks ago, a teacher at Payless East Elementary School allowed me to sit in her classroom and help her out and observe. The first thing I noticed was the amount of technology used at the everyday uh, classroom. And these children were in fifth grade, just keep that in mind. The first thing I noticed was the gigantic smart board up, which I think is a great invention. But I've seen these kids on their phones, Snapchatting, tweeting. These are 11 year olds, they were tweeting. God knows about what, right? So <laughs> um, technology is being funded so much more than other things that are as equally as important. So where is the line for technology and the papers? Where are the books? Where are the creative minds? Where are the drawings? Where are the papers that you write handwritten? 
where is all of that going? It's all going on technology. So really, where is the limit to that? <clears throat> so if we see something we don't like in our classrooms, which might be very common, we should stand up for it. We shouldn't just sit there and be like, OK, I guess I'll take this for another semester. No, there's so many things you guys can do, whether it's going to a meeting, whether it's contacting the district, whether it's just simply asking your professor, hey, listen, this is, one of, this is what I think about this. Everything matters, and everything you have to say or think matters, no matter what. So stand up for the educational system. Stand up for your future kids, for us, for the, our parents who want to go back and get a further education. Stand up for something, and don't just sit down. Hi, guys. My name is Bilal. Uh, let's start. Humans are a breed that always want the best for themselves. They always want that, is, that uh, makes them happy. If there is an urgent issue or an action that needs immediate attention, they will always be there to pounce and take care of it. But some of the times when the issues do not seem as urgent, but they actually are, or they do not know that they are urgent, they'll just let it pass by. One of those issues is uh, animal injustice. And uh, I will talk to you more about this. I spent around 10 to 15 hours at Animal Welfare League. While the time I was volunteering, around six to eight hours, and obviously uh, I was there to attend their orientation. So this included around 15 to 20 hours that I was here at that time. And I heard a lot of stories about injustice. I heard that uh, most of the animals who were there, who were present, were found astray on the street. And this, the look they, that they had on their face was very scary. They had the look on their face that they were just telling us that we do not belong, belong here. And we, we, we aren't supposed to be here. And my message to people who just uh, uh, left their dogs, their cats, stray on the streets is that please do not do it. And the least you could do in these circumstances is to at least give hand over to them to animal care organizations such as Animal Welfare League, obviously. Because they are there for a reason, and that reason is they have been set up to make sure that animals are provided shelters. And if you cannot provide shelters because of any reason, for example, financial reason or uh, family issues, then the least you could do is to turn them over to uh, animal health care organizations. Uh, another thing that I was not happy with was the uh, attitude of the volunteers. I met around uh, 10 to 15 volunteers during my time. And uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of them, you could just tell they were just there for the hours. They just wanted to, you know, uh, make the hours and uh, get things done. So I was not uh, happy with it, and of course I was there for the cause, for the cause to help animals, to help those who help animals, and uh, I was not happy with it. I met a uh, employee that was here, for, that was there for four, uh, four to five years. She she's she's been working, she's still working for Animal Welfare League, and her name is Sarah. She was like in her mid 40s or probably around 50s, and whenever she received a phone call, she would just say that I oh, know I'm at work and I cannot talk to you right now, even if she got like a uh, call from her family. So that to me was really striking, and I was, you know, uh, proud of what she was doing and how serious she was in this cause, how she, serious she was uh, with her work, and I think that all volunteers who go there or whatever we, uh, volunteering they do, they need to take it seriously and, you know, just don't be there just for the hours. And lastly, I feel that uh, people who misuse or abuse animals should be treated the same way as if they have treated uh, humans. People should be reminding that uh, should be reminded that just uh, because they are humans and they call themselves intelligent beings doesn't mean that they are superior to animals. All living beings are equal, should be treated equally, and uh, of course, uh, please learn a thing or two from Sarah. Thanks. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing today? That's good, that's good. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Alex. And growing up, I didn't have very much. I grew up in a poor household. We struggled just to get by every day, not knowing when we would get our next meal or where it was coming from, 
or not knowing if we would be able to live in our home. Poverty is something that many people do not think about. It affected me growing up, and at first I did not realize that I was poor. I thought it was normal to live in the way I lived, to have very little. And honestly, it was not until I entered elementary school that I began to see that this was not the case, that this was somehow not normal. I learned that this I was somehow different when I began taking classes because there were other kids who had nice things and they had nice supplies, and nice clothes, nice school supplies. They didn't have to eat the free lunches like I did, the crappy cold pizza or the rotten milk. They didn't have to eat these things. I wondered why. Was well, somehow I inferior to these kids? And honestly, I thought about this for a long time, and I never found an answer, not until recently. A couple years ago, my parents took me to a neighborhood that was very poor, and they didn't say much, except they just drove around, told me to look around, to take it in. After that, then, they took me to a very wealthy neighborhood and told me the same thing. I did not understand why they did this at first. But then it hit me. These neighborhoods, they both had people living in them, but yet they were very different. The wealthy neighborhood, they had nice, clean streets that were well kept. Lots of businesses that were modern, new, raking in money, keeping the money in the community. In contrast to the poor neighborhood, the poor neighborhood had pothole-filled streets, sidewalks that were crumbling. You couldn't see many people out on the streets. The businesses were all shut down. Buildings were crumbling. There was no hope in these neighborhoods. And I thought to myself, why? Why is this the case? Are these people somehow inferior to those who live in the wealthy neighborhoods? Let me talk to you about things that really affect people and what drives them to poverty and keeps them in poverty. Homelessness. Now many of you may think of homelessness as when you see that homeless man, an old man, living under a bridge in cardboard boxes or on, under, under buildings, the entryway to buildings. Perhaps you've seen them when you've gone downtown. Sometimes you see homeless people. Many times you will see people just walk by like they do not exist. They refuse to acknowledge that these people exist. I ask myself, why? Are these people somehow not capable? Or do they not deserve the same recognition that every other human being gets? I want to tell you today that homelessness is more than just old men living on the side of the street. According to the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, in January 2012, there were 633,782 homeless people on a single night in the United States of America. 62% were individuals, and 38% were persons in a family. Families just like yours and mine. Among these homeless individuals, over 200,000 were youths. Think about that. Children, high school children, elementary school children, without a roof. Think back to when you were younger. You had a warm bed. You had nice things. You didn't have to worry about being cold or hungry. Now, I, may, I know this may not be true for all of you because I do not know each of your stories, but generally, this is how it is. You have a bed, you have a place to sleep. You don't have to worry about these things. But these kids, they do. They do not have a home. They have nothing to ensure that they are safe, that they won't go hungry, that they won't be cold at night. I almost ended up in a very similar situation. During the Great Recession of 2008, my father, the only one in our family who was working at the time, suffered a medical crisis when his knee gave out. He was unable to walk, and being the only source of income in our family, we were suddenly on the, er, the verge of losing everything we had. That was when organizations like Together We Cope, in fact, it was Together We Cope for us, that gave us the help we needed just to stay afloat. We received food. We received help paying for our mortgage, our bills, things that were very vital that most people don't think about. Certainly not children. Children do not consider such things. I know I didn't at the time, although I knew things were very different when this happened. Suddenly there was fear, fear in my mother's eyes, fear in my father's eyes. They were uncertain as to what was going to happen if we would even have a roof over our heads or food in our stomachs. 
In 2004, there was an estimated 11.9% of American households, or 13.5 million U.S. households, that were food insecure. Many people do not consider that these things happen in the real world. This is only something you hear about on the news, such as like when you hear about a shooting or something like that. It, disconnected from reality because you have not experienced these things. But for someone like me who has experiences, I understand what it's like. And I, want, I hope you all understand that you can empathize with me hearing my story, that maybe somehow this will affect you in some way. I would like to ask all of you, when you go home today, I want you to open up your cupboards, your pantries. I want you to take whatever foods you know that no one will eat and just set them aside. Take a box, a bag, anything, stick it in there, and just bring it to your nearest shelter or food pantry or anything. Or even if you, this affects you and you really feel the need to help, to go to a to volunteer at a shelter, a food pantry, just give your time, do anything for other people who are not as fortunate as you, who do not have the same luxuries, the same opportunities that you do. Thank you for your time. All right, my name's Rachel. Um, so when I walk through the city of Chicago and pass a homeless person, what are my immediate thoughts? I feel bad because even though I don't know uh, their personal story, I feel like there's nothing I can do except give them money. But I know in my head the possibility of giving them money, it could either go to drugs or alcohol. But I also feel annoyed because they are constantly asking me for money, and let's get real, I'm a college student like most of you, and we don't have a lot of money. So honestly, the whole situation just ruins my day when that ever happens to me. When I was younger, I didn't understand. I'm sure most of you didn't understand either. So I'm not alone here. I can remember my first experience ever encountering a homeless person, just like it was yesterday. It was mine and my sister's eighth birthday, and uh, my parents took us to see Wicked the Musical. And of course, they wanted to go to a fancy restaurant. I don't understand why they would take eight-year-olds to a fancy restaurant, but they did. And I can't remember what I got to eat, but I did not like it whatsoever. So when we went into the restaurant, I remember seeing a homeless person on the side of the road. And I asked my mom if I could wrap up the rest of my food and give it to them. And my mom thought that was like a fantastic idea. So once we got all of our food wrapped up, me and my sister brought our stuff to the homeless person. And just the look in his eyes that he gave us, he, we knew he was grateful. He was very happy, and he said, bless you. And then when me and my sister walked away from that, we felt like a sigh of relief, and we were really happy. But we knew in the back of our mind that that was only one out of many of people that are downtown that are homeless. So as I got older, I started thinking homeless people were a nuisance. Many of us think they are just begging for money. They are not clean, not nice, and some can be very ungrateful. Don't get me wrong, I still feel awful for them, and I want to help them because I'm, I don't know what it feels like to be in that situation. So I got the experience to help at Together We Cope. It is located in Tinley Park, and the mission of Together We Cope, as they claim themselves, is the bridge to gap for Southland residents in temporary crisis by providing food, shelter, clothing, and referrals, empowering themselves to sufficiency. In other words, they help people who are in need, and they help them from becoming homeless. Of course, when I went to Together We Cope, my mindset was as a typical college student would be. I didn't want to be there, and I was just going there to get what I needed to be done. But as I started helping out there, I realized that my mindset had changed. Most of the people I met there were some of the strongest and nicest people I've ever met. I can't believe some of the stuff that people had to go through. I then knew why I was there and why I needed to be there. I couldn't believe, I mean, geez, child hunger is still claimed to be one of the greatest problems in the world. According to UNICEF Household Food Security, malnutrition is an underlying cause of death of 3.1 million children each year, nearly one half of the global total of children's death. If that isn't an eye opener, I don't know what is. So what are you going to do about it? Poverty is a social issue all around the world and it needed to be addressed. Poverty is undeniably a serious global problem that is not just, na just, not just the nation leaders should act upon already, but citizens as well. 
In 2016, it was reported that an estimated 795 million people out of 7.3 billion people in the world suffer from chronic undernourishment according to World Hunger Poverty Facts. Think about it for a moment. One of your family members, somebody that you know or a loved one, can be part of that number. So what are you going to do about it? Go volunteer at Together We Cope like I did, or find another organization and help out. If you don't think it'll make a difference, it will. Go, go donate food to a food drive. Make posters and make these organiz organizations more well known. Remember, it may not be you in need, but it could be a loved one or a family member. Someone you know. Get up and make a change. Thank you. So considering recent events, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the phrase or something along the lines of, we're all immigrants. Everyone in America comes either from a long line of people who migrated to the United States like in the 1600s or as recently as yesterday. We all came here for a common dream, to make our lives better and to pursue happiness. I mean, that's the culture in America, the pursuit of happiness. This is the same dream that my father had when he one day just decided that he wanted to come to America. My parents and I, my parents and I never talked about it. Um, we lived in a small town in Nigeria and we had a comfortable life, you know. Um, I went, it was, we were like middle class. I went to an okay boarding school. Um, I had some nice family, but my parents wanted more. Nigeria, although it's in this middle spot between third, third world and up and coming country, it's still not as convenient and it doesn't offer as many opportunities for people who want it as say a first world country like America. And so my father dreamt it and he worked. He went to school, he currently had two masters and it wasn't enough. In Nigeria, you can have as much, have as many degrees as you want. Like people literally go to school just trying to get a better life for their families and it doesn't guarantee you a job. There's doctors who are lower class. So having two masters, it was respectable, but it didn't guarantee security for my family. So he, he told himself, I'm gonna pursue a PhD and I'm gonna do it in Nigeria. He got on the internet and started searching for universities here and he eventually found one and they gave him a full ride. He left my family. I was separated from my family for four years. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't see my father for four years. Um, and he was just here focused. Ma they gave him like what, $50 stipend? You know, they were paying for everything. Um, he brought a little bit of cash from Nigeria, but you know, he left us. And it was a lot of stress on my family, but it was for something. Four years later, my dad told me the news, little 12 year old me. You're coming to move, you're gonna relocate to join me in America. And I was ecstatic. I was like, America, you know? I live on in Africa. I haven't even seen any other country except for Nigeria. And contrary to popular belief, it's a continent, it's a continent, not a country. It's a different story. <laughs> um, so we got here and I started school. And I have to tell you guys, it was nothing like I expected. I had been so excited to come here and make new friends and, you know, learn a different way of life and enjoy different food, but especially to just meet people who were so different from me, but had a common and, sh but shared a common human experience, the need for love, pain, the, the experiencing of pain and other stuff like that. Unfortunately for me, 12 year old me felt rejection for the very first time in my life. I had a super thick accent. I was growing out my Afro and I was just an oddball and I was treated as such. I mean, m my peers didn't really w want to take the effort to sit down and be like, hey, what are you like? Or let's have a play date or anything like that. And my teachers didn't care enough to just take the time to assess where I was 
individually in my education. I mean, my English teacher just put me in an ESL class, which was an English for a second language class. And I spoke good English, I just had an accent. They just made that assumption and didn't really treat me like an individual. It was super frustrating. Um, but I know that that pain wasn't peculiar to me. I mean, I remember times when I would be in the grocery store with my parent and my dad would be talking to the cashier and she would be talking to him really condescendingly. And I could see that look of pain in his eyes. You know, he worked so hard to get the pedigree that he wants and to have someone treat him like an illiterate just because he looked a certain way or he talked a certain way. It was heartbreaking to watch. And I know that a lot of you have also felt rejection. You felt the feeling of being weird or killing parts of yourselves because you want to conform. I mean, we live in a country and a society and even the world culture right now just praises conformity and shames individuality. And it's sad. It's so sad and it's so heartbreaking. A lot of immigrants move to the United States every year for the same dream that you and I are lucky enough to just be privileged enough to experience. And that's awesome. And we shouldn't make their assimilation any harder. They just want to have a good life. And that's nothing to fault. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, Mr. McGuire gave us an amazing experience. This, you, um, allowed, uh, you gave us a channel for an amazing experience this semester to go out and service learn. <laughs> Can I use that as a verb? <laughs> um, we had service learning project, and I picked the um, immigration class at Marine Valley. I don't know if you guys know that we have that, but that's one of the resources that Marine Valley offers to immigration um, for Im immigrants. I participated in this class, and I had the privilege and the honor of sharing this experience with so many immigrants. I mean, it was such a diverse group. We had young people from countries like Thailand and older, older people from other countries like Russia. We had almost 20 different nationalities there. And it was so amazing because there was this energy of just motivation to become a part of this society. They want to live here. They want to contribute to this society. They want to be a part and a res resource to this society. And we should allow them. You know, it's, I feel like it's not a bad thing to just want to be, be a part of a group, to, to want to have that sense of belonging. So I offer you a choice and it's kind of mundane and, and super simple. But next time that you're out and about with your friend and you see someone that looks different from you or act different, has different mannerisms, or they just look like they're from somewhere totally random and you can't place it, and you get that immediate feeling of, let me judge them, just take a step back and put things into perspective. Try to empathize with them. Empathize with that desire to be wanted, that desire to belong somewhere. And together, we can revolutionize the, cu the culture here in America. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm Caitlin, and I would consider myself a farmer. And before you go, OK, weirdo came up last. OK, cool. Um, I don't wear cowboy boots, and I don't own a horse, and I have blue hair. Um, but what I do is urban farming, and I'm sure that a bunch of us can relate to it because um, we like practice without even knowing sometimes. Um, even having a flower pot in your house makes you a farmer. Um, agriculture is everywhere. The definition of agriculture is the cultivation of soil um, for crops and the grazing of land for animals. Um, but there's so much more to that because there's different ways that you can go with that. Um, in high school, I went to a school on a farm, and we had pathways that you could go. So instead of picking electives like um, psych and 
really extreme math. Um, we had pathways like mech tech, you could choose finance. There was a teaching pathway. Um, I chose the horticulture pathway, which was cultivating plants. Um, and we had an animal science pathway, um, which we had horses, pigs, goats. Um, we had a greenhouse. We had a whole farm to learn. And I think that's really important because we were a really successful high school. We have a um, farm stand and we market for ourselves. Um, the school did really, really good because the community that we have um, was just really supportive. Everything starts in your community. Um, you don't have to go volunteer at a park. You don't have to have a garden. Um, but supporting that is really, really good. Supporting something gets it further than you think. Um, community gardens are something that's new and happening. And um, I think that Um, I think that we all just need to participate and be aware. Um, when I was in school, I learned those things that a bunch of people don't know and never will maybe know. Um, a lot of kids these days, they have art class, um, which is just painting pictures, but art class could be making pots and planting them. It could be making birdhouses and planting them at a local park. It could be more, but everything starts in your community. Um, after that, you could go further. You can go um, work for organizations. Um, you don't have to volunteer anymore. Everyone thinks that being a farmer means that you have to have a farm. You have to have a horse. Um, you have to have chickens. Um, we did have chickens, but you don't need chickens. Um, you know, it's really important to educate um, the little kids we have because, um, you know, they might not know how to garden and they might not know how to, you know, grow tomatoes when they want to grow tomatoes. Um, and <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm so nervous. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that I'm not asking you to go volunteer somewhere. I'm not asking you to go work somewhere even. I'm just asking you to support that urban farming is something that's becoming really, really popular and it's something that we really need to teach um, the generations that are coming up because, you know, um, like I know personally, my parents and my family were getting really, really old and they just don't even have the time, you know, to really keep farming and to keep um, even having a fish tank at home. And having a fish tank at home is even being a farmer because that's aquaponics and that is something that's really important and that's something that's becoming super popular because then from there you can go to hydroponics and now you have fish and plants in the same thing. Um, and so I think that's it. Um, yeah, I think that we're all farmers here a little and I think that we shouldn't be embarrassed to admit that we could be farmers sometime. So, thank you. Wow, that was amazing. Let's clap again for all of our speakers, eh? All right, so we had a, a, a modest list of speakers today, so there's some time left for any questions or comments that you might have for any of them. Should you have such questions or comments? Yes, uh, here, we'll give you the mic. Um, Faith, did you come to OJ? Did you, Orland Junior High? Oh, you didn't? Oh, I thought that was you. Because we had someone that came and her brother was faithful. And. Oh, he came to OJ? Are they Oh, okay. Because I remember that. Yeah, I do. Uh huh. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, other questions or comments? I have to stand. I can't see you. I'll have to stand in here. Don't be shy. Anything you'd like to share with the group or ask a question or make a comment? No? Okay. Well, then I will make 
did you want to make you, you look like you're signaling no, okay i do that to my students all the time no false moves <laughs> all right well this is not easy as you might imagine uh as all of the speakers can attest to to come up and talk about uh, these these uh, issues, these pressing matters in our community that they've come to care deeply about, that they've researched and they understand in different kinds of ways than they did hopefully at the start of the semester. You want to say something? Oh, okay. All right. I was going into a spiel, but that's okay. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> um, so I was taking notes while people were speaking. Um, and um, like the main speech that I appreciated was, um, was Rachel's, um, how she talked about um, how giving away money to... Um, homeless people could go to either drugs and alcohol and although it's coming from a good place in our hearts but sometimes um like that thinking about that kind of um makes you have second thoughts about it and i i appreciated her like pointing that out and pointing out how um students don't really have that much money to be able to luxuriously give out enough so um i just wanted to point that out you want to respond to that or something? Oh, okay. no, thank you very much. Oh, okay. okay. All right. And uh, of course, um, just to follow up on that a little bit, uh, many organizations that are working on the, uh, the matter of homelessness in our communities, they, they suggest rather than give money directly to people who are struggling with homelessness, that instead you seek to help in other ways through the advocacy of the organizations or if you want to give something directly often as, as we heard giving food or, or other kinds of items that could be of aid to them rather than money because sometimes it is whether it's going to be misused or not the reality is and I've, I've learned this from my own experience working with um, organizations that deal with homelessness is that for example um, you know, $5 alone can get enough uh, street heroin to kill a person. And whether or not it would be used that way, it's a tremendous risk. So there are other ways in which we can help, right? So um, uh, other comments before I start the spiel again? <laughs> Anybody? Uh, okay, um, so I was just saying that I know how difficult this is and I'm so proud of all of the speakers today for having the courage to come up here and talk about these matters. And one of the things that we've talked about all semester long as we've been doing this research and this writing and, and working in the field with these various organizations is that the aim has been affecting positive change. And in my mind, one of the primary tools of affecting change in our communities is communication, whether that be writing or uh, the research to educate ourselves uh, or speaking. So um, I want to encourage all of you everywhere to seek every opportunity you can to speak to other people, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, in small groups, or in front of a larger crowd, about the things that are important to you, about your own, um, the things that you are learning about, uh, the things that you're concerned about, and also to listen, because uh, it's this kind of communication in our communities that I believe can help affect the change that m many of us would like to see, right, the, for the things that are important to you. So I guess that's all I have, unless there's anything else going on. Okay, thank you so much for being here, everybody. I very much appreciate it. Let's clap again.